sideways way, head into the Tantra. And um, I, I'm not saying immediately that the practices that we we're getting ready to do are not you know, the traditional. I mean, they they go to the similar place or the same place that many of the traditional practices do when you're doing daily meditation. But the, the pathway is slightly different because of the shortness of time that we have to explore this second vehicle of transformation, which is part of the Siddic path. And um, as we said, um, we were going to be exploring the journey to understand the shamanic path a bit. So now we're going to be studying daily meditation to understand the Siddic path a bit better. And to remember that both vehicles are uh, methods of uh, helping the practitioner move beyond the ordinary experience of life and move into the non-ordinary aspect of experience. And again, you will remember that with, with the shamanic uh, thrust in doing this process is to understand the forces of nature better and to be able to work with them in a practical, focused way in human affairs. But the Siddha, I mean, as Bob was saying yesterday, there are some Siddhas that also work in that way, but the, the primary thrust of the Siddha path is self-understanding, <coughs> self-transformation, the attainment of enlightenment, the understanding about the nature reality um, beyond necessarily the physical forms of nature and the non-ordinary aspect of its power. So um, we're heading in you know, to an experiential process of the Siddic path, which is a parallel or you know, a counterpoint to uh, the journey. That's what we're getting ready to do. Now, in order to I have to say immediately, deity meditation is a fairly advanced practice that comes and you don't know, really begin to move into this kind of tantric work until you have done quite a bit of, in, on a traditional Buddhist path, a lot of devotional work and you know, a, lot of, a lot of study of sutra and uh, spent a lot of time in what they call the generation stage um, of, uh, you know, generating the capacity to be able to enter into the field of the daily. But I, I have a few shortcuts <laughs> that are not meant to be disrespectful to the traditional path in any way, but I find work very well to give the initiate uh, in, uh, a way in to this very big and powerful uh, way of working. And um, so, but we do have a few steps that we do need to take before we get there. And um, what I'd like to do is to um, do a meditation, a simple shamatha meditation. Well, it's not so simple for most of us, but compared to the daily meditation, it's more simple. Um, I, I'd like to do uh, a, a, a meditation of quieting the breath, quieting the mind through the focus on the breath. And um, I'm going to talk you in, and then I'll talk you out. Then we're going to do one more meditation. Um, to kind of help step in, and then we'll do the deity meditation, um, the first of the deity meditations. Okay? Anyone have any questions? So you can be sitting up or lying down for this. It's up to you. So just allowing yourself to get settled. Noticing all the places where the surface under you meets the different parts of your body.
And as you do, just noticing where your breath is. Noticing as you breathe in where your breath goes. And noticing as you breathe out where your breath goes. And if any thought should come into your mind as you're breathing, watching your breath, let it pass through your mind like a cloud passing through the sky. Don't need to engage it or to fight it. Just let it pass through and then return to your breath. Watching it move in and watching it move out. I won't be doing any talking for a little while. Just continue to watch your breath. Remember, the past is gone forever. The future is not yet here. All you have is the present moment and your breath.
just allowing yourself to consider breathing through your nose, if you're breathing through your mouth. <clears throat> and if you're breathing through your mouth, you can breathe through your nose. Just feeling again the surface under you. Noticing once again every place where it meets the different parts of your body. And then just allowing yourself to stretch a bit. And when you're ready, just coming back fully into the room, taking all the time that you need. ready, just opening your eyes, and just taking a moment to reflect on your experience. We won't have any talking during this time. journal, you can write down any reflections. <coughs> and uh, if anyone has any questions about that practice, go ahead, go ahead and ask me if you have something you'd like to some comment or question you might have. What was the... Uh you know, obviously there was no, there were, I guess there wasn't really an intended outcome, but you led into it with something about days. Oh, I said this is a preliminary practice to the, before we head into the deity. Ah. So what, what we're doing is, uh, and maybe I should have been more clear, stabilizing our attention in the breath <coughs> so that you can, when we get into the field of the deity, we'll be able to stabilize better. Yeah. So the idea with shamatha meditation is to be able to develop one point of focus. And it's a way of, of training the mind because most of us have our mind is going and we don't know where we are or what our experience is because we're being driven by the mind. What we want to be able to do is to be able to get focus and be able to then direct the mind in the way that we wish to, rather than being blown about by, by um, experience that we are not necessarily choosing to be blown about by in terms of our mind's thoughts. So you're talking about literally like eliminating mental noise. Exactly. And that, this process of eliminating mental noise, it, it could be a lifetime's practice. Yeah, I was going to say that I've never yeah. experienced a moment of silence. Right. Uh, it, but very good, very, um, I, I suffered from panic attacks for years, there, multiple times a day, um, and then without medication, just stopped having, because I've got very adapted, relaxing my body instead of having to take like Advan or Valium, which would relax my body for me, so my mind could let go. I got I got very good at breathing from my diaphragm 
laying down and just feeling my body fall asleep. And in doing that, was able to bring bring all the light I needed. That's great. I mean, you found your way to the path. I mean, that that's a valid way, you know. Where but it's never quiet. Well, I mean, you're part way there. You're part way there. I mean, like considering how noisy it was, it's very quiet. It's always right. noisy. It's just yeah. more humorous. Yeah. It'll immediately be humor. I almost laughed in the middle of that. I almost busted out laughing because there's something funny that occurs to me all the time. It just sneaks in there. <laughs> and I can't, you know, it's like, how do you let go of that, which is just holding on? Well, that's, that's the task, right? That's, and, and again, you know, this can be a complex process. And, you know, one thing that I would recommend that you do on a daily basis is to do at least five minutes of this meditation every day. And if you can, do it twice a day. So you can try to get to the place where you can get your mind to rest. I mean, you've done a great job delivering yourself from the grips of panic, but there's further to go. And um, you want to be able to, I mean, I imagine, it sounds like what you've done is you've used, and used your mind to do that, and what, now what you need to do is to be able to let go of the mind, which is scary because that's the thing that helped you, right? I'm not scared of what's so, happening. All right. I don't right. think, I, I, I don't, I don't. <coughs> I'm not able to uh, consciously let go of anything. It's like I have to uh, stop trying to hold on. Okay, well, so then you know the path. I've just never heard it be quiet at all. Yeah. It's always noisy. Okay. Well, for some people, letting go of that noise can be a little scary. So if you do ever get scared, don't worry. Just keep going back to your breath. <laughs> um, so, and I'm not saying you will be scared, but sometimes people grip a little bit, you know that. So, you want to keep letting go. Any other thoughts or comments about that meditation? Okay. So, again, the shamatha process is something that you could do forever, and there's some schools of Buddhism that this is the only form of meditation that there is. And it's very powerful in and of itself. I can't recommend a daily practice of this highly enough. Um, but we are going to move right along and pretend we've done 10 years of this and go on to the next level. <laughs> um, and we're going to do another meditation, a combination of guided meditation and um, shamanic journey. <laughs> so I'm going to, this is a real crossover, this is a real hybrid of shamanic practice uh, combining it with tantric practice, okay? And ultimately, in my opinion, tantra and shamanic practice have a very definite meeting place. So for me, it's not contradictory, but from the outside, it might look like it. So um, what I'd like to do is uh, ask you again to uh, get settled. Oh, I actually, I should probably preface this a little bit. OK, as I said, we're heading into working with uh, the deity, a de the deity meditation. And the deity that we're going to be working with is actually Vajrasattva. And I'm going to be talking more about the nature of Vajrasattva. Uh, as we do the next level of meditation. But uh, you'll notice, I'm going to actually let me let me just send these around for you to take a little quick look at. And I want to thank everyone again, Craig, especially how um, and Justin and uh, for helping get these Vajrasattva images to us. Um, and we have uh, three Vajrasattva images here. That might be chin raising, actually. Uh, but we have these two on either side of Vajrasattva. Um, and I'll be talking more about the whole context of daily meditation in just a little bit.
But the main thing that I want you to notice about Vajrasattva is that Vajrasattva is white. That white refers to the clear light, that it is a constellation of energy that brings forward and contains the clear light. And um, this idea of the clear light is an idea that you find throughout Buddhist practice. Sometimes you hear it referred to as the ground luminosity. And the clear light, if you've, uh, if you've ever spent too much time with Buddhist practice, there are different references to the clear light um, with di in different contexts <clears throat> earlier on the path before you get to the Tantra. For instance, you have this concept of Buddha nature. And uh, Buddha nature is, um, uh, Buddha nature is this aspect of ourselves that is consistently connected with the field of the clear light, which is characterized in the context of Buddha nature as compassionate, equanimous, joyful, and um, but which is infused with this clear light. And you also have references to the clear light um, when you have the teachings of the two truths, where you have the uh, discussion of the two levels of reality or experience of reality that are possible, which is ultimate reality and relative reality. And we could talk for about a year about this concept. But the aspect of relative reality is the experience on the realm of image, where everything is related to one another, which is the no way we normally experience reality. And then the experience of reality on the ultimate level is actually the experience of the clear light, which is unchanging and does not move within the uh, forms of um, relative, it, it is there behind or within the forms of relative reality, but it is unmoving um, in comparison to the way in which things are changing all the time on the relative level. And the unchanging aspect is the clear light. And there are practices um, in Mahayana Buddhism and in Bun, uh, called uh, Dzogchen, which is the practice of being able to perceive the clear light through any experience or to know and have an understanding of the ultimate reality in the midst of any relative manifestation. So again, these are huge practices that I'm introducing to you in three minutes, but I, I want to give you a little bit of context for the importance of the clear light in Buddhist practice and in Buddhist understandings of the nature of reality. And ultimately, uh, yeah, I mean, Bob is probably one of the most beautiful interpreters of the nature of the clear light and, and the access points to it and the way that it informs our ordinary experience. And I highly recommend listening to his podcasts. They're accessible. You can listen to them every day. Um, at, at, at where he talks about these different levels of experience of approaching the clear light. Um, but, uh, and the way in which phenomenon dissolves into the clear light ultimately. So, I mean, these are all conceptualizations that I'm mentioning here about the clear light. And what I would, I'm going to endeavor to do in this meditation is to bring you into a visceral experience of it. So uh, just allowing yourself to get settled. Noticing, once again, all the places where the surface under you meets the different parts of your body.
And as you do, once again, just noticing where your breath is. Noticing as you breathe in where your breath goes and noticing as you breathe out where your breath goes. Just beginning to notice as you're breathing in and breathing out, the way in which your breath is almost like a bridge <clears throat> between your outer world and your inner world. And just allowing yourself with each breath to draw a bit closer into your inner world, into that place where everything that you've ever known or felt or sensed, or dreamed, or imagined, is recorded. Just following your breath into that place within you. As you breathe in, following your breath into that place within you where everything that you've ever known, or felt, or dreamed is recorded. And as you come into this place, just allowing yourself to let all of your inner senses open. Letting your inner sense of taste, touch, and smell open fully and widely. Letting your inner sense of sight and hearing open fully and widely. And especially allowing that sixth sense of just knowing to open fully and widely. And as you allow your inner senses to open, knowing that you may receive information through any of them, allow yourself to become aware of the guide that you met through the shamanic journey yesterday. Just allow yourself to become aware of the presence of the guide that you met yesterday. Noticing where you feel the guide's presence, if it's in front of you or behind you, to your left or to your right, or above or below you. And again, knowing you may Receive information about the guide's presence through any of your senses and just letting yourself connect with the guide, once again becoming aware of its nature, its personality, and the power that it carries.
and just asking your guide now to bring you into the field of clear light. You don't have to know how to do this. You can just ask your guide to bring you into the field of clear light. Just follow the guide and allow your inner senses to open fully and widely as you begin to focus on what you know about the clear light. You don't have to know everything about it. Just focus on what you do know about its unchanging, compassionate, clarity. Just continue focusing on what you know about the clear light and ask your guide to bring you into the field of clear light, letting all of your senses open so that you can experience the clear light through sight, through sound, through even smell, taste, through touch, or that sixth sense of just knowing, knowing that you may experience the clear light through any or all of these senses, knowing you don't have to focus primarily on sight in order to perceive the clear light. experience with what you already know of the clear light. And you can ask your guide for any further instruction about the nature of the clear light. (coughs) 
knowing that you may get this information through a feeling in your body, or a telepathic knowing, or even verbal instruction, or an emotional experience. And just allowing yourself to take all the time that you need and just come back to watching your breath. Breathing in and breathing out. Resting in your breath, bringing your focus to your breath. Taking all the time that you need to do that. Letting go of the experience of guide in the clear light and just returning to your breath. And just watching your breath move in and move out. Just following your breath out into the outer world, feeling the surface under you again, and when you're ready, you can stretch a bit, taking all the time that you need to come back fully into the room. Open your eyes and reflect, and perhaps write your experience. We won't have any talking during this time. I'm going to send around the spray if anyone wants it. like to do now is um, have everyone go around and say a word that they feel uh, captures their experience of the clear light. Pervasive. Uh, we're asking, we're talking about a word that um, captures your experience of the clear light. And Simone just said pervasive. Do you have a word that describes the clear light? Also, 
<laughs> Easy and at ease. Calm. And um, my use of the word of initiation is a little bit different. Uh, I mean, they're the simo very similar things, but I'm talking about it in a slightly different way than you'll hear Bob talk about it. Um, in, in, a tr in traditional Tibetan Buddhist practice, when they talk about initiations, they talk about the Lama or the, uh, the Rinpoche generating a field of uh, power by invoking the particular deity that uh, they, whose power they are going to transmit to the people who are participating in the ritual of the initiation. And you can have initiations of any number of Tibetan deities, or any, doesn't have to be Tibetan, any number of deities. So you know how we were working with the mantra last night, where we were saying the prayers of Tara, and the idea, as I mentioned, is to use that sound to draw Tara in, to, um, to provide a pathway for the power of Tara to move from non-ordinary reality to ordinary reality. And when you are generating uh, prayers um, <laughs> to a particular deity or to the initiations of a particular deity, you are doing the same thing. You are creating a pathway, you're creating a ritual, and the process of initiation itself in these types of ceremonies is, again, a, a pathway for the power of the unseen to move into the world of the unseen. And in the traditional method of initiation, <coughs> in the Tibetan Buddhist method, um, that the unseen power is generated through the prayers and practices and rituals that the Lama engages in. He gathers that power and then transmits it 
to the people who are participating in the initiation. And this is, ex you know, remember when I said that um, both shamanism and Siddhism, Tantra, um, have something in common in terms of the way that they are working with the transmission of energy and power. And so this and ritual is used as part of that transmission. So you can see that here, right? Now, I'm going to talk about initiation in a slightly different way. It's not, it's not that it's ultimately different at all, but it's a different approach. And ultimately, they do the same thing um, as the initiation that I just described. But the way that I'm talking about it is something that is more generalized and something that can be applied to many different situations where initiation does take place. And one of the things that I'd like to start with um, saying is that um, um, most of us do not really have a clear understanding of what an initiation is anymore. Um, we, um, you know, if we have this idea of initiation, we think about gangs or, you know, like, you know, you have to go shoot someone to be able to get a access to a gang, you know, that kind of thing. When we hear that word in the popular media, that's usually what people are talking about. Um, but um, the idea of initiation is uh, a, a very profound and ancient concept that you find in both Siddic and shamanic traditions. And remember we talked about how we were going to look at the way in which both traditions work with ritual and initiation. Now we are looking at how they're both working with initiation. And initiation is actually the process of becoming. And uh, the initiate who is called to the path, like say for instance the shamanic in the shamanic path, the initiate who is called to the path through a strong dream or a strong vision uh, that they need to understand may have to go through some kind of an initiation in order to be able to access the power that is in the heart of the meaning of that vision or that dream. Or, for instance, if someone has some kind of disease or calamity that befalls them, that turns them inward toward the spiritual path, and they have to go through an initiation, the actual the calamity or the uh, um, disease can actually be the initiatory propulsion that challenges the initiate to begin to um, meet the challenge of changing the form of their way of being. And this is what initiation does. It is a process whereby the old forms, the old ways of being fall away and where there is power released at that moment that then is ideally dedicated to the new forms that are going to take place. And I'd like to give you an example of that that is it's one of the few places where we still have initiation in more or less the dominant culture, which is in the Juda Judaic tradition of the bar mitzvah or the bat mitzvah, where you have a ritual, that a ceremony, wherein the young person at puberty is recognized as having attained a certain level of adulthood. And this is usually some kind of mark, uh, traditionally a mark uh, that is biological in nature. That either the, the girl steps into her monthly cycles, or the male has, uh, the boy has pubic hair that uh, appears. So these are, these are the, the signs that the, the child is becoming an adult, and they create a ritual of the bar mitzvah which marks the falling away of the old way of being of childhood. There's power released in it, 
And that power is dedicated actually to the Judaic tradition. And the child is bound as an adult in the new form into the tr Judaic tradition. So in that, and this is one of the, so there you have the old form of childhood falling away and the new form of adulthood taking place, uh, coming into form, okay? And you have in all traditional cultures, whenever you study traditional cultures, you're basically studying initiatory rites. Most, um, most, uh, cultural anthropology classes focus on these different rituals or initiations that mark the falling away of an old way of being and the stepping into a new way of being. And um, in the classes I teach on the sacred feminine and tracking spirit in the birth environment, we focus intensively on understanding the nature of the power that is released at these different moments of biological experience for women, such as birth, the onset of the monthly cycle, the sexual encounter with the other, birth or the decision not to give birth, menopause and death. These are all driven, these initiatory moments are all driven by biology. And there is power released in each one of them as the woman moves from one form of being to another. We also do this, one of my senior students teaches the class for Sacred Masculine, although I keep trying, you know, I've got all this hair that's growing on my chin, you know, my old age, and I can think, I, I could be a guy, right? Yeah. But n nobody's, nobody's letting me teach that class yet, so. Um, and, uh, in the sacred feminine class that we teach, that I teach with Bob here in um, in uh, in on the spring equinox, we look at this process of initiation in a slightly different way, and um, uh, we look at the way in which the goddess uh, generates the creative impulse at the time of the spring in, uh, spring equinox and understanding the nature of that creative generative power, both from the shamanic perspective and from the Buddhist perspective. And, um, and we look at the different types of initiations that the goddess has always put her initiates through. So there's lots of different places where we can focus more on the nature of initiation for now, what, and what happens to the power in initiation. For now, I'm just asking you to understand the way in which initiation is a process of the old form falling away and the new form coming into view or experience. And again, even with the Tibetan forms of initiation, which Bob will refer, be referring to, there is an old form, an old way of holding power that falls away as the participants in the ceremony receive the power that the Lama has generated, right? So there is that same shift in, in experience. So the characteristics of initiation are that they are intimately tied with change. They bring the initiate into a new state of being. And they do this by challenging the status quo. Things can no longer be as they were. And one of the problems that we have is that we will often resist this process always create some difficulty. So in the way that, the, so initiations will challenge the status quo, and the way this challenge is met determines the initiate's experience of the initiation. I'm going to come back over this in just a minute. The initiate's experience of initiation determines what kinds of lessons or purifications the initiate needs to undergo in order to be able to move to the next level of consciousness or new form. So in, when we're talking about the initiations uh, in Tantra with the di different deities, we're talking about the old forms, a way of being, 
and way of holding power and awareness falling away through the encounter with the deity and the field of power that the deity holds as the initiate strives to be able to hold the power of the deity. And that's the idea of holding the power of the deity meditation is to enter into the field of the deity and be able to hold on to its particular power. In order to do that, generally speaking, there is some aspect of one's experience that needs to broaden or widen or shift to be able to accommodate the encounter with the larger vibratory field of the deity. Okay? So, we're going to be working with the deity of Vajrasattva. I think we're going to do this tomorrow because I'm going to have plenty of time. Um, uh, um, which is in Vajrasattva is in and of itself a purification field <coughs> and so that entering into the field or the initiation of Vajrasattva is preparatory to entering into the other fields of other deities because Vajrasattva is, in its essence, a purification field. And when, when we talk about purification, we're talking about the removal of any kind of obstacle, such as a karmic pattern, as we were discussing this morning, or any kind of emotional state or any kind that would prevent us from being able to participate in the field, or any kind of resistance, any kind of doubt, any kind of regret, any kind of um, internal process of negativity that would keep us from being able to open fully to the power of the deity. And so what Vajrasattva does is Vajrasattva offers a process of initiation which prepares you then for larger experience in working with other deities and being able to hold and sustain the power of their fields. Okay? You with me? All right, I'm going to go over the process of initiation and we may just go ahead and do that one right now because we've got a good field form right here. So I think I'm going to step into it. So um, I'm going to go over the characteristics of initiation once again. They are intimately tied with change. They bring the initiate into a new state of being. They do this by challenging the status quo. The way this challenge is met determines the initiate's experience of the initiation. And the initiate's experience of the initiation determines what kind of lessons or purifications the initiate needs to undergo in order to be able to move to the next level of consciousness or the new form. Now, I want to go over these last two points a bit more in detail. The way the challenge is met determines the initiate's experience of initiation. I'd like to offer you this. So, let's say we have a, an initiatory process uh, for a young girl who is uh, coming into her monthly cycle. The society around her says, oh, she's cursed now. We have to separate her. She's dirty. She's unclean, which is a very common cultural view, right? Her experience of that initiation is going to be different from a young girl who is met by the society around her as she steps into her monthly cycle with joy and elation and congratulation, right? She's going, there's going to be two very different experiences. And the way that those experiences are met are going to determine the next initiation that her biology puts her through, which is the sexual encounter with the other. So if she's been told that she's cursed and separate and you know, dirty, the way that she meets the next initiation 
the sexual encounter with the other is going to be very different from someone who has stepped into sexual maturity and has been congratulated and there is great elation, right? So, so you can see how the initiate's experience of initiation determines what kinds of lessons or purifications the initiate needs to undergo in order to be able to move to the next level of consciousness or awareness. So in the first case, where the, the woman is reviled, she's going to have a completely different set of initiations that she's going to go through, and a, a, completely set, a completely different set of needs as she moves through the initiation of the sexual encounter with the other, than the woman who has been, uh, re has been congratulated. And she's going to have a completely different set of needs and requirements going through the initiation of the sexual encounter with the other. Right? So, so, and, and, and that in, initiation, that experience is going to come from her own response to what is happening around her. So, one of the things is that we have all had the initiation of birth, being born, right? Most of us have not had great experiences if we've been born in the medical industrialized society hospital, right? So the kinds of initiations that we have, that are requirements that coming out of that initiation in terms of being able to meet just the, any kind of transition and the initiation that any kind of transition would bring are going to be very different from a child that's born into a, a, a very natural, supported environment, right? In my book, The Return of the Great Mother, I talk about this. It's, it's, at, at length, just in terms of the initiation of birth, it's over in the bookstore if you want to look more into that. So, um, we are all kind of coming into life with, you know, our kind of hand tied behind our back in terms of being able to move through these initiatory processes that consciousness puts us through and that our own biology puts us through. And, um, and the task is to be able to um, re-pattern our experience of previous initiations so that we can hold the power and move into the new forms that our future initiations will bring us to with more success and grace and power. And the experience of the initiations of Vajrasattva are designed to prepare us to do that because it is a purification field that removes obstacles so that you can hold power better as you move into the further lessons of the Tantra. So I would like you to focus on... No, we don't have time to do it. Sorry. I never know what I'm going to teach you. I mean, I have a general idea. But... Um, but um, I think we'll probably need to take some questions on this rather than moving right into the field. Um, um, but what I would like you to do is I would like you to focus on an aspect of your experience that you feel you could use help with in terms of clearing. So for instance, you had this very helpful thing come through the dream. You can choose any three of those points, right? And that's what you'll be focusing on, or you can choose something else. Um, uh, and when you're moving into the, the field of Vajrasattva, um, you may have some experience of your life that you sincerely regret, um, that you wish that you had not engage some experience you wish you had not engaged in that keeps you from being able to move forward in your life because you can't quite let go of the regret. Um, that might be something that you would focus on in the meditation because that places of constriction or that regret creates are places where power, you can't hold power, right? Or there may, so when you're moving into the fields of the different deities or into the practices of the different tantras, if you don't, if you have that constriction, you're not going to be able to hold the power that's presented to you and you can even have a ricochet effect 
where you have a bad experience, which is why the Tantra is so well protected, because you can do damage if you don't take it step by step and keep creating space within you for ever greater capacities to hold power and awareness and consciousness. And this is what I'm talking about when I talk about, you know, you throw someone in the clear light and they go, <laughs> right? You need to develop, I mean, I just did that, but I did it in a very stepped in way. And that was just, the, you know, putting your toe in, you know, I didn't, you know, you're not like full on dissolving in the field of the clear light, right? So, um, uh, but um, the, the important thing to remember is that with each initiation, there is, an, there is uh, when you're working in the field of Vajrasattva, the nature of the initiation is to remove the old form where there's some kind of constriction so that you can hold more power as you move into uh, the uh, next experience of uh, the initiatory process in the Tantra, either moving into the field of other deities in this context or other practices. So, think about uh, if you have a fear, for instance, like if you have a fear of flying or um, you have a, a fear that keeps you from doing something that you really want to do. Think about some aspect of your experience that is limiting you in some way or think about a relationship where you are still engaging in some kind of toxic interchange with someone and you don't know why you can't leave or and you don't know you know why you don't know you don't understand the source of the toxicity or you don't understand why you're not happy in the relationship when it seems like you should be there's something going on in the relationship dynamic that needs clearing and so that you can be able to step more fully into your full expression within the relationship. So that would be, you could focus on a particular relationship and bring that into the field with Vajrasattva tomorrow when we do the meditation. Okay. So, um, does anyone have any questions or comments? Just to be clear, you're saying when we go into the field that the point is to bring our shortcomings very consciously with us, and it's not to ignore them, but to consciously yes. bring yes. them into the field. Yes, and we're going to ask for Vajrasattva to remove those obscurations because Vajrasattva, what Vajrasattva is all about is removing karmic residue. And, um, um, uh, creating different experiences of purification so that the initiate can move safely into the, the further levels of teachings of the Tantra without having the power of that, those teachings ricochet off of their obscurations. When trying to, do, to decide what to focus on, do you have recommendations of like there are three things that are coming up for me and I'm not sure which one. Just choose the one that draws you most strongly tomorrow. Like just focus on all three right now and then when you get into the meditation, see which one emerges. And then don't worry, you can do this meditation again. <laughs> this isn't your only opportunity because we have nothing but time, <laughs> right? So um, that, that, that's what I'm looking Anyone else have any questions or comments? What is the, is the origin of the word Vajra and Sattva? Mm -hmm. uh, Bob will talk to that today, this afternoon. I, I, I was going to talk to it, but Bob knows a lot more Sanskrit than I do. <laughs> and Vajra, I, I, I will talk a little bit about it tomorrow, but I was hoping that he would really go into that. Um, Let's ask Bob to do that, okay? okay? I mean, I could do it, but you know, his elucidation on this sort of thing is so brilliant. We shouldn't miss it. Yeah, but it's nice to have two views. Right. Well, I'll do a little bit more tomorrow. Okay. Um, uh, but 
I, I think I think you would be best served by by, by being exposed to the rest of Bob's mind on this. <laughs> I promise I will talk my own humble way about it. <laughs> uh, anyone else have any questions or comments? Um, how specific should we be with the thing that we're going into? In other words, do you have self-belief generally, or a specific thing, or do you have a relationship generally with something, or a specific thing with it, or like... Whichever, how? whatever you can access. Okay. So you can get quite specific or quite general. Like you could have, like you could just have this relationship with like your neighbor that it just really sucks. Right? <laughs> and you don't know why. You like you can't figure out why do I always have such a bad experience with this person. Then you can bring and, and it disturbs you and it keeps you from feeling at home in your house, right? So bring that whole thing in. You can bring the whole fur ball in, right? And and let the field work on it and kind of open it for you. And you'll get insight about it as it clears. Or, you know, you may find, okay, like I do know that my, the relationship with my neighbor is problematic because my, you know, that my neighbor has negative intention toward me, okay? And then what is it, what is my response to that negative intention? And how can I, uh, you know, my negative response, let's say my negative response is to have negative intention back at them, right? So then, ask to be cleared of your own negative intention. You can't do anything about the neighbor. But there you pulled out one of the pieces of fur of the fur ball that you're going to work on. Okay. All right. Any other question or comment? Okay. Good work, everybody. And uh, we're going to just, we are just, we're not going to say any words, but we are going to seal the.